Yeah, he's right next to me. You don't have to have a video. video. Yeah. Good, I see you both. All right. Um, hopefully, you all are feeling pretty good about the test. Um, uh, did anybody see the test earlier in the week? Anybody besides the one I know about? We had a, a weird Moodle glitch in that the exam was actually visible through a different route. So I ended up rewriting it a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah, Devin, did you see it? I wish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> One of your classmates very honestly sent me a note right away and told me what, was, what had happened. And so I talked to the tech people and not really sure how it happened. I've never experienced that before. But so that was a rewrite of the exam. So I, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, we'll see. I'm always more comfortable when I write it and I have multiple days to sit and look at it. But this one was only two days because I only found out two days ago that it was visible. So we'll see how it all went. Um, I'm, I'm intending to grade tonight and get it back to you um, uh, by lunchtime tomorrow for sure. But I usually just do what we'll grade this evening. I don't post until I have all of them graded in case I need to go back and revise things as I, as I grade. So um, it'll be pretty late tonight before, before it's posted if I get them done tonight. Uh, all right, Joe and Devin, are you guys ready to start? Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. want me to advance the slides or do you want to do it? That works fine. Okay, we'll, we'll, I'll go ahead and advance them so, uh, uh, so you don't have to do that. And oh, for everybody, um, uh, a couple of you sent me a note and said, hey, I, I couldn't um, upload the signed doc, the signed um, honor code. If you can't, uh, if you didn't upload that honor code, go ahead and send me an email and tell me uh, um, this is my signature for the honor code. So that's, that'll work just fine. Okay. All right. That's the end of test talk. And let's uh, get on. All right. All right, we'll, we'll do a little bit of an echo. Um, so we say everything today with a bit of a caveat, uh, because I'm just going to get a... Go on mute, go on mute. All right, that sounds better. Uh, everything with a bit of a caveat, because um, all the trade war stuff we're going to talk about over the past week before this seems to have gone out the window a little bit today. That being said, uh, you're, I'm still getting an echo. Is it you over there? Are you on Okay, I'm getting an echo as well. So everybody, if you would um, mute your uh, mute your um, your speakers. And Joe, are you logged in as well? Yes. Make sure yours is both muted and the volume is off of your computer for the time being. I think that's it probably is. the problem. Is it? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and try again and see. You're not on mute. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we figured it out. Uh, so basically, um, if you look at this graph, market had a, a, a pretty big sell-off the end of last week. We'll talk about why. Uh, had a bit of a recovery in the beginning of the week and then took a big slide on Tuesday. Like I said, since then, it has recovered. Today was a good day. Um, well, like I said, a lot of things that we are going to address and talk about seems to be in the matter of one day, not as big of a concern, which is just kind of entertaining, but it's also just kind of uh, uh, the nature of the beast. Um, moving up, so some of the major headlines, the next slide from um, last week. Uh, the biggest one that happened Tuesday was uh, United States added some Chinese companies uh, to its blacklist. Uh, I think most people saw that. Um, it's again, it's political pressures being done through the markets. Uh, this was done to basically punish and chastise uh, some Chinese companies, uh, tech companies, um, treatment of Muslims uh, in, in China. Uh, and the U.S. State Department got involved saying that it was going to deny visas for um, some people tied to these companies. Uh, manufacturing report came out uh, at the end of last week. It was not great. Um, manufacturing continues to fall. Um, uh, it's it's basically the lowest uh, lowest it's been in in ten years. Um, the the indice was a uh, four point seven eight. Uh, anything above fifty is growth. Anything below fifty is um, regression. Uh, the Fed cutting the the Fed rate. We will talk about that in a little bit more detail. But that came to the table 
Um, and we're going to talk about that. That was kind of a reaction to the manufacturer report. The jobs report did come out after that, and that was uh, more positive. Uh, 136,000 jobs added in September, and unemployment is at a record low of 35%. Um, and just one kind of, and, and I'm looking at things more of a macro level. Joe's going to get in a little bit more micro, but on a macro level, uh, Hewlett Packard announced that it's also cutting 16% of its workforce. Um, so getting on the federal rate cut, and we, we, we touched this a little bit last week um, with our presenters last week, but it, it's gotten to become more of a, a talking point, and it's basically where can the Fed go? Um, they basically said they are now scheduling a rate cut that wasn't originally scheduled um, amid pressure from both the economy and the White House. Um, and the big question is now, could rates go negative? It's something we've seen in the European markets. Uh, the rate, the last time it was ever cut to zero was the 2008 recession. Um, and then just kind of talking about some, you know, bad outcomes or, or indicators for cutting the rate so low, you know, discourages personal savings. Um, earnings for banks would take a, a big hit. Uh, the online banking model would take a hit. Uh, and then, you know, one thing to point out is, while well, lower rates can be good for stocks. You know, why? Why are we, you know, decreasing those rates so lower? So it's kind of the environment that that's happening. And I don't know if people have an opinion. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, where can the Fed go? And I guess I throw that out to anybody who's willing to discuss that. Uh, you know, the pressure is there, uh, but what do you think they can and will do? You're always welcome to call on people, Devin. <laughs> that's that's a bit awkward. We're all they're all cracking beers after that midterm. And we're not doing that here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying, you think that, if you think it's the Fed will cut rates, you're saying? So, yeah, they announced they're probably going to have a, a, a late October rate cut that wasn't scheduled. Um, I think they definitely are. I think they're going to continue to cut rates for sure. In my two cents, at least. Yeah, I mean, my concern is if you can get, you know, 0.05% on a you know, personal CD in a bank, you're doing good. I mean, where, where do... Where do personal finance investors kind of go? I mean, the mom and pops kind of investing, it's, it's out the window. There's, there's you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty concerned about cutting it that low. I mean, maybe I don't have the whole picture, but I don't know. Does anybody else have kind of thoughts and opinions on this rate? Hey, Devin, this is Mike. Um, it's not so much a rate thing, but I know just in times of recession, people tend to go to commodities like gold, silver, things like that. So while you may not make a lot of money like in a bank account, a lot of folks tend to invest in those things because that's where people tend to, you know, and it's kind of like their, their uh, what's the word I'm looking for, their safety net. Um, so I, I haven't really been watching gold or anything like that lately, but I know like in 2008, like gold hit some serious, I think all time highs because people were investing in, in gold, you know, versus other um, products. So I, that's just kind of my thought. I'd be curious to see where the commodity markets go over the next three, six months. Um, because the rates are so low, you're not going to make a lot of money on them. And, and I remember that personally. I, I, I remember that being discussed amongst some of my peers. I, mean, I think I'm a little bit older than some of the people in the class, but I do remember, you know, 2008, 2009, people saying that. And I, and I remember myself maybe being a little bit more conservative, being like, wow, is that what we're, we're going to? Um, so that's something to watch out for. Uh, obviously, that kind of is the, one of the biggest levers to kind of control our economy. Um, the next slide, Joe and I kind of discussed about this next slide about whether <laughs> we're comfortable bringing it up. I think it has to be brought up. A study was released. I don't intend for this to um, become political. I don't want to take any political sides, uh, but it's in the news. Uh, but basically, a study did come out that said, you know, our president's tweets are affecting the economy. Um, you know, the, the, the tweet yesterday of, um, you know, destroying and obliterating a, a foreign country's uh, economy. Um, like I said, I'm going to open this up for discussion. I do it a little bit scared 
Um, but, you know, well, the, the big banks came out with statements about that study. Basically, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, all three of them basically said, yeah, uh, we do have a president that is affecting the markets uh, with his Twitter account. Uh, I think that's unprecedented, um, both in the White House involving itself heavily and also social media. So that's as far as I'm comfortable going. I have my own opinions. I'm not going to share them here, but I just love to hear, you know, being as um, friendly as possible. I think it's something that the girls last week dipped their toe in and, you know, Joe and I kind of decided, you know, it's a little bit of the elephant in the room. Let's kind of pull that bandaid off. And yeah, I do think we have a president that is affecting the market um, in, in, you know, how educated are the people that, are being swayed and how educated are, are you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll kind of throw it out there. Look, I'm dying to hear people's opinions. Way to be, way to be brave, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's an interesting conversation. I think, um, it, and I don't know if it's hit that point yet, but I think at some point, uh, eventually people are going to start ignoring it. Um, I would, I would assume, or I would hope. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting time to be alive, I guess, is the best way to look at it. I, yeah, I just find it shocking that major banks have said, yes, Twitter is affecting the market. Um, that's just mind-boggling to me, but yeah, it's undeniable. Hi, Devin and Jeff. Joe, sorry. <laughs> I think, um, as Professor Leggio said in the first class, like our world is changing by technology. So the tweet and the internet are definitely impacting differently now in our economy. So I will assume that uh, our president and in the way he's tweeting these economic and political issues are really affecting the market um, or affecting the economy. So I will think in, in future presidency, maybe it's not gonna do the same as Trump, but this is like establishing a precedent for something that has not been done before, but I think people are really looking into the president tweets to see what's going to happen next. So I'm not sure if it does affect the economy, but it is really like, I think it's affecting people. Yeah. And the way the, they think. I think the trade war is maybe the biggest or the threat of a, a trade war has been the biggest driver uh, since we have gathered as a class uh, you know, in this third quarter into the fourth quarter. Um, it, it, and this trade war is kind of single-handedly being painted, whether it exists or, or doesn't, via, via Twitter. Um, so I don't know. Joe's going to get a little bit more micro, but I'd love, you know, take one more minute if people want to kind of chime in. I think people do want to chime in on this. I just think maybe mm -hmm. people are just <laughs> as stepping on eggshells as maybe I am. Hey guys, it's Wendy. Um, maybe not even the social media, but more so just members of like the presidential can uh, cabinet and, you know, the arrests or the inquiry on other people related to President Trump. So I think that we're going to start to see a big impact there. I didn't get to read the whole news story, but weren't there another two people arrested today for ties to something um, with the Ukraine investment? So, I mean, I didn't really get to look into it too much, but I think we're going to continue to see more drivers just related to him. All right. Um, I think that's like Hold you on. Said. I, was, I was waiting until everybody else had a chance to speak. Yeah, uh, I'm dying to hear what you have to say. I, um, uh, I go, I'm on Twitter, but I don't look at it unless there's a big event that happens. So if there's an October crash, I'll be on all day watching the latest of the news that comes out. But I don't look at it regularly and I don't follow the president. Um, and so this was jaw dropping to me when I read this, my unmatched wisdom. I mean, the things that he says, you know, I hear it on the news, but I hadn't seen anything like this before. So that was surprising. The, the, the piece with Goldman and Merrill and JP, I was so glad when I saw you post this because you are taking us about four chapters ahead. One of the things that happens in the markets is we, ha we talk about market. <laughs> doesn't mean you did well with the presentation, but this is a great story. <laughs> the, uh, when we talk about markets, we look at 
Is the market efficient? Is it reacting properly to news? And there's three different types of efficiency. And we generally think that the market is what we call semi-strong form efficient. And that means that all news out that's publicly available is incorporated into the stock price. And if you believe that, when the president tweets, the, the market should adjust because that's news that if you, know, you, you discount the news in some way. So, well, okay, so is he going to obliterate um, Turkey? Well, maybe there's a 30% chance. And so that, you may not 100% believe it, but that 30% chance is incorporated. Uh, do you remember when that Johnson & Johnson story came out and they had, they had um, gotten, they had to pay like 1.2 billion, but it was, could have been 4 billion. And so on, on, the, on the 1.2 billion, the stock price went up because the market had incorporated 4 billion. And, and so it was good news that it was only 1.2 billion. So the, the economy is thinking, the, the market is thinking about this and, and they're playing the odds of what the likelihood is of each of these tweets actually occurring. Where I think the president has to be careful is with SEC um, investigations. If there's any indication that he's profiting, his portfolio is profiting from these kinds of events or he's trading it all on it or any of his relatives are trading on any of this, they're in big trouble. When you, when you start to look at Goldman and Merrill and JP Morgan saying, yeah, these are moving the US markets, the next thing that happens is people will develop algorithms to trade on that and start making money on it. It's not illegal, but he's creating volatility in the market and that's a dangerous thing it's one of the reasons I think historically presidents have been more cautious about what they say and they haven't communicated with the market as frequently. You know, you'd have a spokesperson who once a day would report something, but you wouldn't have the president being very off the cuff in some of these comments and, and pretty outrageous in some of these comments. That's going to move the markets, not necessarily in an efficient way, but the market's got to react to news. And so it does react and then it reacts back. And so Devin, when you talk about, well, you know, the market's correct at some of the things that happen because there's some off the wall things that are being said or proposed and then, and then it's backed away from that. Well, that's an opportunity for algorithmic traders to make a whole lot of money at the expense of you and I, if we try to suddenly say, oh gosh, we're going to have a war with Turkey. I better get my money out of the market and put it in those zero interest rate savings accounts. Um, so it, it could have very negative effects on people. And this is, um, it's interesting that all three of these very large banks have come out and said, you know, this is, this is impacting the market. People are going to trade on it if they're not already. Great. So moving on, Joe's going to get a little bit more micro level of kind of what's going on. Yeah, so Devin uh, touched on, you know, he gave you guys a macro overview of what's going on in the market right now. I'm going to get a little more granular, granular and highlight a couple uh, stories that I thought were interesting and relevant to what we've talked about in class so far. And uh, you guys might find it interesting as well. So looking at the first story that I wanted to highlight, um, Roku versus iRobot, I thought it was interesting how analysts kind of control this narrative um, and looking at this contrasting outlook for, you know, both companies. Focusing first with iRobot, the company that's behind Roomba, other household helpers. Um, they had a pretty rough year, uh, particularly in the last six months. Um, the previously high-flying stock has decreased uh, more than 50%, which can be attributed to three things, weakening revenue growth, poor leadership, and negative impact from tariffs. Um, since yesterday, more bad news has come down the pipe for iRobot, as analysts from Raymond James have downgraded their stock thanks to strong competition and pricing pressure. Um, mainly from a competitor, Shark, and they now project the stock to underperform and are predicting a rough holiday season to contribute also to, to the decline as consumers opt for more cost-effective alternatives. Now, Roku, on the other hand, is doing extremely well thanks to a growing user base that is expected to substantially increase by 2020, as well as near tripling of revenue. Um, the stock has, has gone up 8.1% as of yesterday, uh, analysts believe Roku's smart TV integrations, as well as opportunities in international markets, uh, they can drive user space to more than 70 million users by 2022, up from the 30.5 million active accounts it has up today. So, I mean, their stock's around $130 a share, iRobust down to 54, and this is all really driven by the analysts coming up with these um, evaluations of what they think the company's going to do based on the factors we just discussed. Before we move on, iRobot really 
blue uh, in a market position they had. They were the leader in the technology and they have allowed everybody else to catch up and surpass them. So they're gonna continue to struggle. My guess is they're, they're gonna have a leadership change over here pretty quickly because the holiday season's not going to be good for them because there's better products than theirs on the market. And that wasn't true for years. If you, if you wanted a, a, you know, one of those vacuum cleaners, you had to get a Roomba and, and that's not, not true any longer. Roku is doing great in this, um, in, uh, in its competition right now. So yeah, they're in good shape. What are you gonna yeah, say? Personally, I have, I have a, a Yufi instead of a, Ira, or a Roomba. So I have one of the knockoff brands. It's just it's much cheaper and uh, kind of a no brainer. It does the same thing, it runs into the walls and turns around, and gets back into, into my, the living room. So. My daughter has that Roomba and you can't be anywhere near it because it's so loud when she runs it. And I got the one that um, was on Amazon day that was the product of the year. And it's a whole lot quieter. It seems to handle okay. It, it, catches periodically but um it's it's a decent product and yeah Roomba just is not getting good reviews anymore which is mm -hmm. bad news for them so it's a pretty pretty big week for uh biotech companies we had three biotech firms uh raising a combined 320 million dollars as they all successfully completed ipos over the last week uh leader of the pack was viella viella bio um raised 150 million dollars they develop drug candidates that are designed to turn off the underlying cause of autoimmune diseases. Um, they raised their money through the issue of 7.9 million shares of stock at $19 each. Um, conversely, Frequency Therapeutics, a Priya Therapeutics followed suit, raising $84 million and $85 million respectively. Um, kind of a big headline off to the side, because they did an IPO, ABC Therapeutics. Um, they were the largest plant IPO of the week. They had a valuation of about $1.8 billion. Um, they decided to not join the party, citing market conditions as the reason. Um, now, given with what we've seen with WeWork, um, I would assume that you know how them having their financial statements published, having them under a microscope really brought the company down. Maybe ADC has some issues internally. Um, what do you guys think some factors could have been in their decision to not go public? I mean, they had a $1.8 billion valuation. That sounds pretty good. But what do you think? Peter? What are two reasons ADC would decide to not IPO? <laughs> Too bad you didn't mention Endeavor, but you know. <laughs> Why do you think they did an IPO? But Joe, I think you might have hit on one of them there. I didn't actually read the story, but uh, more than likely when they start cracking open the books and really taking a look at numbers, what investors might have expected to see just didn't kind of line up to the real picture. Um, I, I don't know how frequently that happens, but I assume that's probably usually a pretty big contributing factor. Yeah. Anyone else? And you have a weak IPO market right now, so that's also contributing. Uh, typically, when they do the road shows, if there's not enough uh, interest and it doesn't look like the stock price is going to be able to hold up, then uh, then better to back out and try again later once the market picks back up. This is a tough market right now because of the ones that have gone poorly. And we'll touch on that in the next slide. So obviously you guys hear me the title, um, the shaky IPOs, similar to the tech bubble. Um, came across an interesting article this week where former NASDAQ CEO, uh, Bob Greenfield expressed his concerns that this year's recent IPO boom feels very similar to that tech bubble that took place in the late 90s. Um, you know, while many of these companies such as ADC Therapeutics have these billion dollar valuations, uh, you know, they could experience a lackluster reception once they hit the market if you can't show that clear path to profitability. Um, case in point, you have Lyft, Uber, Peloton, all struggled with this and uh, are, are all among the worst performers um, since their market debuts. And again, similar to 99, which was the year before that bubble burst, um, only 20% of the IPOs then reported positive income in their first year uh, as public companies. And now just 24% of the 2019 IPOs will uh, report positive net income this year. So something to watch. Um, which, they don't think it's going to be another tech bubble and you know next year the bubble pops and all the companies that come out in IPO are going to be even worse off and ha not have that path of profitability but it's something to absolutely keep an eye on it i'm sure it has a uh, effect on those that are deciding whether or not to go public 
Now this is um, this is good timing for this story because one of the things that is different this time than in the tech bubble is the market has has spanked these um, these ten billion dollar um, unicorns and has said you know it's not good enough just to have high valuation you have to have profitability and so you're seeing companies pull back that didn't happen last time you just kept getting bigger and bigger IPOs that the market's being a little bit more wary this time which which holds up for a less likelihood of this being a driver for a recession. So that's that's actually good news that they're that they're pulling back a little bit on on funding some of these guys. And uh, we we spoke about this briefly last week, but I read an article, or we read an article uh, came out yesterday, um, talking about soft banks, you know, enormous losses continue continue to mount in the wake of the WeWork IPO blunder, um, as well as Uber's sharp stock decline, costing the company billions of dollars. Um, analysts have estimated SoftBank's main investment vehicle, which they call the Vision Fund, has experienced a loss. They're calling it around $5.4 billion. It's not set in stone. Um, you know, the fund specifically could book a loss as high as $3.5 billion due to the drop in value from Uber alone. Um, and with WeWork's valuation continuing to decline, it could experience a loss as high as you know, $2.8 billion. Um, and while on the topic of WeWork, an article came out today that I read where only one of the early investors, the uh, Jefferson Financial Group, not appraisers as I wrote there uh, incorrectly, they sliced their valuation of its holdings in the co-working company by more than 54%. And based on their valuation, their stake in the company um, has brought the, their valuation of WeWork down from initially it was $47 billion. Now they're valuing the company at $15.4 billion, which is, is a pretty drastic drop. On the next slide, please. Okay. Joe, did you end up listening to that uh, that uh, journal a podcast on uh, SoftBank? Did I, I tell did you not. Guys about, did I tell you guys about that? I couldn't. I never remember which class I talked to about that. Yeah, there's a really good. It was published. It, it came out on the third or the fourth, I think, on um, the journal podcast, which is Wall Street Journal's podcast. They're about ten minutes longer, and it's all about SoftBank's CEO. It's excellent, um, and and uh, it talks exactly about what you're discussing here, and and the bad bets that they've made recently. It talks about that that fund as well. So this is a discussion slide. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of color on uh, the article that we read and uh, throw some, put the question out to you all uh, at the end. Um, we touched on this earlier in the semester uh, about the inversion uh, yield, yield curve. Um, but Duke University professor uh, Campbell Harvey warns now that it's time to, pre to prepare for a recession as the bond yield curve is currently flashing code red. Um, this is a condition that is the inverted yield curve, which is predicted the last seven recessions going back to the 1950s. Um, and then this flat, this inversion briefly made an appearance in March, but turned uh, lower again in May, where it continues to stay. So it was inverted for about two months. Um, for the inversion to be reliable and have a recession most likely hit, it would need to stay inverted for at least you know, three months. Um, while this is not news we should be excited to hear, uh, you could argue that those watching the curve should have the awareness and then the opportunity to plan ahead and prepare for what others might not know is coming. Um, so that being said, is this something you guys are watching since we you know, spoke about it earlier this semester? Um, and if so, are you guys doing anything that to prepare for a potential recession? Um, you know, honestly, <laughs> I, ha I have not been paying attention. I have not been preparing, but moving forward, this is something I'll definitely you know, want to keep an eye on and then kind of closely monitor and you know, maybe put a little extra in your paycheck aside for that rainy day that, that might hit. Um, you know, ignorance is not an excuse anymore. So, you know, we, we're kind of in the know. So it's something I, I would definitely recommend tracking. Is anyone out there, you know, following this? You know, what do you guys think? Remember, class participation matters. <laughs> I don't know, Joe. I'm planning to work till I'm 85 anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can, I guess, chime in just from, I guess, some things we've talked about here um, at Brown Advisory. When you're looking at the market, um, yes, this is definitely a key indicator, but I guess from our investment philosophy, we look at other indicators such as just strong fundamentals of companies. And we look at a lot of the companies we invest in, we look at strong cash flows. And to date, those haven't really been hindered yes, just yet. So 
I think, yes, this is one indicator, but the economy is still doing well. Um, I think eventually it will need to slow down just the way the market works, but um, I'm personally not too concerned. Um, and I'm just going to keep looking at basically company fundamentals. And when that starts to deteriorate, then I think we should probably be a little more concerned. Give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is Dave. I'm uh, just kidding aside. I mean, until the president starts tweeting about the recession, it won't happen, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, the yield curve is only one of the indicators. I mean, we also have to look at the global growth. But I mean, uh, the trade war is impacting that a little bit. Unemployment, that's a constant. Another one uh, we're always talking about. I think um, reset the recession talk has become a recurring topic. So I think it's making people more apprehensive about it. And it's, uh, I think, although we've been talked about it since probably the beginning of the course, I think more and more people are learning what the yield curve is and, and what uh, being inverted and how, what that means. Um, so personally, um, being a government employee, I know in that sense, you know, is, is secure, but uh, investments in future, things like that, you know, that does cause some worrisome. This is Mike. Um, from my perspective, I'm worried, but knowing that I'm not going to retire, somebody said till I'm like 85, like if there is a recession, I'm just going to ride it out of my account. If my 401k takes a dip, okay, so be it. Um, I have a buddy who's in finance and I'm I actually talking about this and he's like, nobody's ever won by trying to predict the turns of the market, whether good or bad in the long term. He's like, so you are truly better off just letting it go. Don't check your statements for a few months. Um, so I think that's kind of at least my plan. I, I'm worried about it, but like, I think there's, I have more to lose by either, you know, pulling my stuff out and missing additional gains or when the market does bottom out, you know, riding the, the, the bottom and um, the top again. So I'm just letting things ride and, you know, I'm hopeful that as with previous recessions, um, the market will just bounce back eventually. I'll, uh, I'll add on a tip this in terms of the recession. What I thought was interesting, we actually talked about this today in one of them, and this is Ty, by the way, um, were the job numbers in general. And the number of temp jobs is going up. So what we were talking about is usually at the beginning of the cycle, it's actually seen as positive when this is going up because people are bullish on the market and they're, they're, I guess, have a positive outlook on where the market's going. So they'll hire temps and, you know, obviously seeing how the market's going to play out. But now as we come to the end of the cycle, it's a kind of a reverse to that as well. So they're going to be hiring temps in case they need to start laying people off. Um, because they're uncertain of what the market's going to do. So um, it's kind of aside from the jobs number as well, if that adds any value to the thought of a recession. I'm kind of curious about something. Maybe some of the, the T. Rowe and Brown people might have insight of this. Do the houses ever try to like short a yield curve by like moving money out of the bond market and going into maybe international or short-term securities? Is that something that happens is that a conversation i i don't know i mean to be quite honest with this i'm just kind of curious of is there a mechanism to kind of short the yield curve people they can like in cds or default swaps i think unless professor correct if i'm wrong on that you don't really short uh like treasuries or anything at least to my knowledge but i could be wrong there but i think the credit default swaps are going to be where you'll see people betting against certain things yeah. Yeah, you, you pull money out or you you uh, move money around, but you don't, I, I don't know of instruments that short the yield curve. Yeah, I agree, me neither, so. But I didn't either, I just try to think it's an of interesting anything. idea. I think essentially yeah. you're, you're, you're going against the yield curve by, by putting, moving your money into stocks and commodities, moving it out of bonds and treasuries. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking, more, more of a short term kind of. Uh, uh, I got a couple of questions before we move on here. First of all, Campbell Harvey is a big deal. Um, he has been around since oh, probably the 70s or 80s, and he's he's uh, the fact that he's talking about a possible recession is a big deal. He's um, he's a pretty well known um, predictor of the markets. Now, the inverted yield curve is a signal of of a recession. 
but it has to stay for a, a period of time. Joe, I don't, I didn't see this article. Has the, the yield curve been inverted for three months? I don't think so. Yeah, it, it went from, um, it did for March, April, and then in May it corrected. So okay. it was about a month and a half, two months. Yeah, yeah, and, and it has been temporarily inverted a couple of, a couple more times. But mm -hmm. while it has, an inverted yield curve has occurred before the last seven recessions, there have been lots more yield curves, inverted yield curves, other than just the seven that happened for recessions. The other thing you've got to watch is back to that market efficiency chapter we're going to get to. What has held historically isn't holding so well. Beatrix men mentioned that you know we're in different kinds of environment now. We are. So just because an inverted yield curve worked in the past doesn't mean it works in the future. So I think that's that's important. It, it's a sign, but it doesn't mean that it's a, an automatic that we stay the yield curve stays inverted for three months. We're doing a lot more manipulation of the markets now. The Fed's much more involved. Um, really controlling inflation rates and things. It's, it's much more controlled than it had been previously. And to Mike's point, if we hit a recession, do not pull your money out of the markets. The, if, unless you believe that the U.S. economy is going to fail. Short of the U.S. economy failing, what actually happens when you, have, when you continue to put money into your 401k, you're buying stock at a lower price. And so when the market comes back, you bought in at a lower price and you're going to profit even more. So um, the worst thing you can do is to, is to panic when the market declines, unless you believe that the U.S. economy is going to fail. If you believe that, get your money out and put it under your, under your uh, mattress. But short of that, you shouldn't be pulling your money out. Now, if you have a lot of money in um, uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign currencies or, or you've got money in the Venezuelan economy, you might want to think twice about that. But um, in general, your money should stay in the market when, uh, when the economy's bad. And as Mike said, stop looking at your statements. It, you're not retiring this week. So, um, so just let your money ride and continue to invest in the market. In fact, I would tell you my strategy is to put more money in the market when the, when the market's down because um, it's a time for me to move money into the stock market. And I'm a whole lot older than you, much closer to retirement than you all. And, uh, and I, I still hit the market pretty hard because the U.S. economy is... is still the best economy in, in the world. And there's a lot of positives. It doesn't surprise me much when manufacturing is down. We're not really a manufacturing economy anymore. I pay attention to these um, um, uh, unemployment rates and I think they are too low right now. We're, we're having, that's causing issues for some of the um, service sectors right now. They can't hire enough people and so their service isn't as good. And that, that causes change of behavior of people. So there's, they're um, going into the holiday season. I mean, how long has it been since we've seen um, uh, help wanted signs in windows? And you're starting to see those pop up in a lot of service industries. You're gonna see and hear more of it as we head into uh, the fourth quarter when everybody is ramping up for the holidays. So um, yeah, an inverted yield curve is typically not a good thing. We are nowhere near that being the indicator of a recession because it just isn't holding um, in its inversion for a long period of time. Enough, enough of that. And so to wrap up and keep an eye out for you know these topics next week and see how they kind of play out. Um, you know, we work. How how low will it go? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it went down from forty seven billion dollars down to it's been valued by the Jefferson Group to fifteen point four billion. Yeah, you know, that's that's a dramatic decline. It's interesting to see how it continues to kind of fall and now that um, the CEO Newman is out of power in a non executive role or whatever that means. Um, he's still kind of involved with the company, I guess. But it'll be interesting to see. I guess they have two co CEOs and we'll see if they can kind of right the ship kind of keep them steady at $15.4 billion or keep, keep on a steady track and not keep dipping in value. Um, and to go with that, SoftBank uh, continue to experience major losses. Uh, you know, I think take a look at the Uber stock and you'll know instantly whether or not it's going to be a good week for SoftBank. Um, they're married closely with Uber and WeWork. So as, as both go down, so will Soft. Um, and uh, three more biotech companies are scheduled to IPO uh, next week as well. Um, Bio, BioNTech, HBT Financial, and Veer Biotechnology are the three. It'll um, be interesting to see if all three or none of them um, will come out and, and test the waters in the market. Um, and, you know, the ever present trade talks with China. You know, are we actually going to see a deal get struck? How is that going to affect tariffs? How is that going to affect the market? Are people going to be bullish? We'll have to wait and see. All 
All right, good. Anybody have anything else they'd like to add? Yeah, I have one thing. This is Cece. Um, yeah, Cece. So this is super recent, um, and I'm sure the group that goes next week will cover this. I'm always really fascinated around retail news, um, and Bed Bath & Beyond named their new CEO. So Mark Triton, who um, was an executive at Target for a long time, um, and made a lot of really good improvements um, and, and really helped drive that stock up for Target. Um, is now Bed Bath & Beyond's new CEO. So um, he specifically did a lot around like merchandising and working with Target's, you know, owned brands um, and is a, a huge reason why Target, you know, has been able to sort of um, capture some of Amazon's, um, you know, vibe when it comes to online shopping and drive up and order pickup and stuff like that. So I think it'll be really interesting to see what he does at Bed Bath & Beyond, especially considering like, before this, I would consider them maybe one of the retailers that might be on the way out, <laughs> but maybe not anymore. Who knows? Good, a good point, Cece, and I would agree with you. Uh, if you walk into a Target and look at how they've changed recently, and then walk into a Bed Bath and Beyond, and the the feel of the store has been the same for the last twenty years, except it might right. feel a little more um, unorganized than it had before. It's a, it's a little sloppy. Uh, so yeah, he he could be really good for Bed Bath & Beyond. And I believe the week before they announced they're closing a whole bunch of stores. Now, yep. just, just right sizing, supposedly. So it's a good sign that they hired a good quality um, CEO who actually knows this business and, uh, and may be really effective at helping to improve Bed Bath & Beyond. That's a good, good point. Any other stories you guys want to talk about? This was a really, really good um, uh, review of the week. The, you hit so many important, both macroeconomic stories and some of the micro stories. Next week, be prepared. We should have a bunch on earnings. There's a lot of earnings coming out this next week. So uh, I'm guessing we'll, we'll hear a good bit about that. Uh, let's see, okay, this is the right file. No, it's not. Let me find the file that we need. There it is. Well, I'm sorry that I'm doing this to you on the night that you had a, a midterm, but this and chapter 10 are my favorite chapters in the book. This is, this is the crux of finance. And so we're going to start on chapter nine tonight. We're not going to finish it. I, I know uh, this is not the easiest night to, uh, to focus on this chapter, but hopefully you'll find it a little bit fun. And so um, the problems will be uh, a little bit enjoyable to work on. And the next time we're going to finish up chapter nine, and I would tell you to read chapter 10. We probably won't get too far into it, but nine and 10 meld together so nicely that it's often difficult to talk about things in chapter nine without hitting some of the concepts in 10. We will in no way will we finish 10 next time, but we may, might get started on it a little bit. So if you have some time this week, try to get uh, chapter 10 videos watched and the, the chapter read as well. So when we try to evaluate a project, we, um, we have to come up with a method to evaluate it. And this chapter goes through the, the five, six main ways of evaluating projects. And really we're going to come down to, there's three that are used primarily, but we're going to learn how to do all of them. So we're going to start with this, this example. Let me put up all of it. And I'm going to walk you through this whole example. Um, okay, we've got an investment that's going to cost $100,000 in cash outflow, and it's going to have inflow of $25,000 per year for five years. Current required return is 9%. The payback cutoff is four years. So we have to calculate everything. The payback period, the discounted payback, the NPV, the IRR, and I'm going to tell you the profitability index too. So that's the fifth method. We'll do all of them, and we'll do them together. Um, First of all, that $100,000, is that an, a, a source or a use of cash for the company? Use cash. It's a use. We have to spend that money today. And if we spend it, we're going to get sources or cash inflow of $25,000 every year. That's the way most of our projects work. We have an initial outlay today in year zero, and then we're going to receive cash in the future. So for this problem, um, what's the rest of the problem? Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to pull it up in Excel to show you in Excel. That'll make it a little bit easier. So hold on one second. Get back over there, which is where I was a second ago. I had this all blown up. There we go. Okay, so here's our problem. We have 
we have a hundred thousand dollar outflow today and we're going to bring in twenty five thousand each year for five years so is this a good project well let's start with payback payback says how long does it take to recover that hundred thousand dollars and so we look at it and we get twenty five thousand in the first year are we paid back no next year we get another twenty five thousand so we have fifty thousand altogether have we been paid back or recovered our hundred thousand dollars we have not the next year we have another twenty five thousand we have 75,000 altogether, still not paid back. Year four, we have another 25,000. So by the end of year four, we've recovered 100,000. The payback criteria in this case said you had to be paid back in four years. So according to payback, this is a good project and we should go forward with it. All right, now the problems with payback. Where did that four years come from? Well, somebody said four years and there's no, there's no scientific method to determine how many years it takes. So somebody might say you should have to be paid back in two years, in which case this project would have failed because we only had 50,000 by the end of two years. So the payback is arbitrary. It doesn't pay attention to the time value of money. The 25,000 I get in year four is just as good as the 25,000 I get in year one. And in today's dollars, they're not the same because 25,000 four years from now isn't worth as much to me as $25,000 today. So that's another failure. It's nice and easy. It's an easy technique. And I would tell you when I do valuations, I use NPV, IRR, and I use payback. And most of the time when I see valuation, companies use payback. And they use it as a supplementary method. And the reason we use it is because what it tells us is how quickly do, is um, this project accretive to earnings? Or how quickly does it, how, how long does it take before it stops diluting earnings? So for these first three and a half years, the company is losing money, losing earnings on this project. They haven't recovered their initial investment. And we care about that because publicly traded companies have to support have, having positive um, net earnings so that the markets don't react negatively. So when you get a project approved, people are asking, when is, when is this gonna be accretive to earnings? Well, payback will give you that sense. So I use it as a secondary method so I can answer that question right away. Because it, doesn't, it has flaws, they came up with a way to say, well, let's try, let's try a discounted payback method and see if that solves some of the problems. So the discounted payback method says, take the cash flow in the first year and discount it by the 9% rate to come up with its present value. So, So the formula here is this $25,000, I'm going to find the present value of it in one year at a discount rate of 9%. This $25,000, I'm going to find the present value of it at a discount rate of 9% for two years. This one is $25,000 for three years, four years, and five years. Everybody good on how I came up with that discounted cash flow column? Those are all just present values of these numbers based on how many years it will, they, we need to discount them back to get them back to this time period. So then with the discounted payback, what we do is we accumulate these cash flows. So we have 22,000 in the first year, we add another 21,000 in the second year, so we have 43,000 altogether. And we're trying to figure out how quickly we're going to get paid back using the discounted payback method. Well, the discounted payback, because the cash flows are discounted, it's always going to take longer than the payback method to get paid back. And in this case, by the end of the fifth year, we still haven't been paid back. We still haven't recovered our $100,000. If the rule stayed at four years for our discounted payback method, we would have said, well, this, this project isn't any good. It fails. So based on payback, we'd say it's a good project because it got paid back in four years. Based on discounted payback, it's not a good project. We didn't get paid back at all based on discounted payback. Any questions on discounted payback? Okay. Okay. The next Could you highlight that cell again really quick? Sure. Well, let, me, let me just actually do it. Equals the present value of the rate is 9% comma, and then the, my number of periods is this year here is one, comma, and then no payment, and then my future value is 25,000, oops, what did I do? Oh, what did I do? Oh, oh, I forgot a comma, and so it closed out, comma, and then this is my future value to come up with my present, my, my uh, present value. For this one, equals present value, 
I have the same rate, comma, the number of periods is the year, it's five, comma, it's zero for the payment, comma, and my future value is this 25,000, close parentheses, I get the 16,000. Good? Got it, thanks. Okay, okay. Okay, so discounted payback is the same thing as payback. We just have to figure out which year we're actually gonna get paid back. Um, now, let me show you something else while we're here because the problem I'm gonna have you do on your own in a minute, mm, probably not, Never mind. Um, yeah, I won't show you that because we'll do it next time because I think you're gonna be more than ready to stop in a few minutes. Um, okay, so payback said we get paid back in four years, good project, check. Discounted payback said, we don't get paid back in four years. In fact, we're not even paid back in five years. It's not a good project. NPV is what we had been doing previously. So NPV is equals, except now we have an initial outflow. So now it becomes really important to make sure that that year zero is outside the cash, outside of the parentheses. So it equals NPV. And then the first thing it wants is the rate, which is 9%, comma. And then it wants the value. Remember that with NPV, this is the formula Excel messed up. So you can only include years one through the end of the life of the project, close parentheses, and then add in the negative outflow, the year zero outflow. Oops, that's in percentages. So then I've got to change that cell format to, let's do it to numbers. And we only need two decimal places. I will leave it at three. Okay, so everybody see how I calculated NPV? So your NPV is equals NPV, the rate, and then the cash flows in years one through the end of the life of the project, close the parentheses, and then subtract the initial outflow on the outside of the parentheses. And we come up with an NPV of ne negative 2758. Is this a good project? Let's see, who haven't I heard from in a bit? Um, Jen, is this a good project? I'm sorry, I was busy writing down. Okay. Um, so we came up with a negative 2758 for our NPV. Is this a good project? Oops, I think she's muted. Um, this is not a good project. Good projects have zero or positive NPV. What this is saying is that if we invest $100,000 today and we require our money to earn 9%, we're actually going to lose $2,758 or $2,700 on this investment. This is not a good project. So the NPV rule is always to accept projects that have a positive NPV. This does not, so we wouldn't accept this project. The next one that we're going to take a look at is IRR, which is called the internal rate of return. So inter the IRR is a nice formula, and it tells you what rate is your project earning. And the formula is equals IRR, and then it just wants the values. And now the challenge with this is IRR does include year zero. So you highlight all of the values, and then put a comma and put a point one. Why did I put a point one? See where it says guess? IRR is an iterative process to find out what the what the rate is and so it needs you it needs a starting point so they call it a kernel for where you're going to start this um, determining what the rate is so I always just put in point one and it came out with eight percent but I would tell you to go back and format that cell and add a couple of decimal places so that you make sure that you you see what the actual number is so it's seven point nine three percent is this a good investment well, the IRR rule is, is if the internal rate of return is greater than your required rate of return, it's a good project. In this case, it's not. It's, this are, we require projects of this level of risk to earn 9%. We're only earning 7.93%, not a good project, don't go forward. So that's how we come up with an IRR. Uh, now, IRR is so much easier to explain to your boss. Is this a good project? Nah, we have to earn 9%, it's only earning 7.9%. So this isn't a good project. The problem with IRR is it breaks down at certain times. Sometimes you have projects uh, like, um, let's say you are um, uh, you had a landfill, and at the end of the life of the landfill, you have to decommission it. And so in the last year, instead of being a $25,000 um, cash inflow, it's a negative $25,000. 
I mess up all the numbers here. But if it, if if you if your your cash flow stream changes sign more than once, yeah, change a sign here from a negative to a positive. If all the rest are positives, you're fine. If it's negative, 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 and then positive, that's just fine. That you run into problems when the cash flows go from negative to positive and then back to negative again. IRR does not work. So you, you got to be careful in, um, in using IRR only when you have the one set of, of changes in, cash, in, uh, in the sign on your cash flows. It's easier to explain, but NPV always works. As long as your assumptions are good, it's harder to explain. You, know, you say to your boss, well, if you invest $100,000, if you can't do this project, we're going to lose $2,700. What exactly does that mean? Or even worse, if you invest $10 billion, we're going to end up with a, a, an NPV of $1,000. This is a good project. What do you mean? Well, what you're saying with NPV is when we take into consideration the riskiness of our projects, which we're representing by our rate, and we look at that and take it into consideration, we're still going to earn, we're going to create value for our company as long as that number is positive. That's, that's the explanation. We'll go into a little bit more on that next time. All right, I'm going to show you profitability index. Profitability index was an attempt to fix the N, to fix um, IR, fix the explanation with NPV and also to fix the IRR. It's much like NPV. It's equals um, NPV discount rate, comma the values in years one through five close parentheses, and then divide by a negative initial outlay. And we come up with 0.97. What profitability index says is for every dollar I invest in the, in the project, I'm going to earn 97 cents. So in other words, I invest a dollar and I only get 97 cents back. Profitability index we use if the profitability index is above one. It's not above one in this case. So this isn't a good project. Now, profitability index has problems when we have, when we have mutually exclusive projects, so uh, it breaks down at times. Overall, the best way to evaluate a project is with NPV. When I do valuations, I typically run an NPV, an IRR, and a, and a payback period. I never use discounted payback. I never use profitability index either. There's, there's a couple of others. There's an accounting rate of return, which is really horrible. Not that I don't even teach it anymore because it's, um, it, it's all based on accounting numbers and it's just not a good realistic method. Um, but these are the five rules that you see. The ones we will see most frequently in actual usage is NPV, IRR, and payback. Um, but we need to learn how to do all of them. Uh, I just Any questions on any of these five formulas we just did? With um, IRR, you said it was 0.1. Is it any positive value, or should we just start with the, the smallest possible value? You can do anything between um, between 0.0001 and 0.9999. So any any number in there, you can put 0.5. It, you can put any number you want. I just am in the habit of always putting it a 0.1. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same answer as long as you have standard cash flows. Negative cash flows change into positive. You're going to come up with the same answer. So just, just pick a guess and put it in there. Uh, the only reason I put 0.1 in there routinely is uh, so that you guys don't get confused if I put a 0.3 in there this time, 0.5. Well, what do they mean? It doesn't matter. It, it just has to be some fraction between 0 and 1 or some percentage between 0 and 1. I have a question. Yeah. Is it a coincidence? Okay, Nabil, try again. That was not me, but I think he's asking the same question I'm thinking of. Okay. Uh, which is, is there a relationship between the profitability and the cumulative cash flow? It looks between like numbers are the same, about the same, exactly the same, except for the decimal. Wait, say it again. Yeah. Is there a relationship oh, between profitability and the rate? And the cumulative cash flow, the 97,000 versus 0 0.972. Wait, I'm still, I'm still not getting you. Is there a relationship between this one and this one? Did you, yeah. did you look at the cumulative cash flow in year five? Oh, oh, oh look at that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you yeah, there is there is a relationship because in essence, what you did here is you found the present value of all of the cash flows. And in this case, because we're dividing by 100,000, it's just a percentage. But that won't always be true. That was 150,000. It wouldn't work out. That's correct. Right. It works out just because it's divided by 100,000. 
Any other questions about these methodologies? So I have a question, Professor. When you calculated earlier the rate, um, when you said that the, it was not a good project, you were using the 9% rate that is expected to be earned in the project? Correct. The so that, okay, no, so good. does that mean that with that expected rate, it's not a good project, so we should have an, a higher expected rate for it to be a good project? Correct. So this rate here, we're going to learn how to calculate that rate later on, but that rate says based on how risky this project is, in order for us to create value for our company, this project has to earn more than 9%. What the IRR tells us is it's only going to earn 7.93%. So we're, we're selling ourselves short. We're going, we, if we do this project anyway, we're taking a project that doesn't earn enough to account for the, uh, the riskiness of this project. We'd be far better off investing in a different project with the same level of risk that would earn the 9%. Thank okay. you. So the decision criteria with IRR is the rate higher than the required rate. And if it is, it's a good project. If it's, if it's below the required rate of return, it's not a good project. And you'll notice NPV and IRR gave you the same decision here. That's almost always true. But next time we'll see with mutually exclusive projects and a couple of times IRR doesn't give you the same, the, um, the same answer. So NPV is always going to give you the right answer. IRR typically does. Payback is, is a junk method, but it tells you about earnings dilution. Um, and profitability, it just isn't really used because it breaks down with uh, um, when, we, when we go to mutually exclusive projects, it doesn't work either. So what it tried to solve, it really didn't. And discounted cash flow is um, too much work uh, to do discounted payback given how little value, uh, additional value you get with it. So really NPV, IRR, and payback are our main methods that we're going to use. Any other questions before we wrap up for the night? Yeah, can you go back to why, when you looked at the MPV, how did you know that that was a bad project? Because it came out to be a negative 27.58, and that, so NPV has to be above zero to be good. At zero, it's neutral. At zero, it says, if I spend $100,000 in um, given the level of risk, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a full return on my money. Anything above zero says I'm creating value by undertaking this project given the level of risk, which is represented by that 9% rate. Anything below zero says I'm, I'm destroying value. Good, Jen? Yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I changed my mind. We are not gonna do 10 next time. We just barely touched on nine, and this is a really important chapter. I'd rather, I'd rather you have more time. My guess is you didn't spend a whole lot of time on chapter nine this week. So I'd rather you have, spend some time on, this, on the videos with the book and come back next time, and we really focus on chapter nine, do a bunch of problems, make sure you're really comfortable with it, and then we'll get to 10 um, the following week. So don't bother reading 10. Just focus on nine this week. Uh, look at this problem again. Um, if you would take a screenshot right now of this problem and work this problem a couple of times so you're sure that you can do this, you can calculate all of these rates, or if you can't, let me know where you're having trouble. And then we're gonna start doing a bunch of calculations next time to make sure you're really comfortable with these methodologies before we move on. So just chapter nine next time, we are online again. I will re I'll go over the exam next time as well, but when I um, post grades, I'll also send you your exam uh, later tonight. So watch for that to come in. And, uh, and whenever, if, uh, you know, first of all, I, I will tell you, uh, I'll also tell you what the curve is. And what I do for curve is the top score gets rounded up to 100%. I think it's a 200 point exam. So you get rounded up to 200 and then everybody else gets that number of points. So if the top score is a 160, everybody's going to get 40 points. If the top score is 200, you don't get any points right now, but I reserve the right to curve more at the end of the semester if I need to. Uh, usually the projects and your review of the week pull your scores up and, and there's no real need to, to um, curve more. But if I need to, I have the ability to do that at the end of the semester. Okay, so I will send you your exam back. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going over your questions uh, on the exam this week, but I will next week, we'll answer all your questions and I'll go through every problem. At, we'll, do, we'll do the exam first, we'll do review of the week, and then we'll jump into chapter nine. Good? You guys have a good week and I'll talk to you, uh, see you. In, online in Zoom next week.
Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.